Good afternoon, my name is Dave Norton from Discovering New England History, and we're going to begin episode three of the story of the Hindenburg, which is quite a New England story back in 1937. So we'll begin with the next slide. Yep. Uh, Hindenburg, we're going to recap a little bit. They made, actually made seven round trip flights in 1936 from Frankfurt, Germany to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And there's a couple of pictures right there. A lot of folks don't really know that. And of course, they had hydrogen in, in the um, Hindenburg and uh, had no problems. And now we're going to go through the final flight of the Hindenburg. It happened in May 1937. And uh, continuing from the last episode, the Hindenburg was uh, striking out across the Atlantic Ocean, heading for Lakehurst, New Jersey. And this newspaper article is amazing. They, they were 12 hours late. <laughs> and because of the s such strong headwinds, they could only go 37 miles an hour. And um, of course, the maximum speed is 84. So they lost 12 hours in flight time fighting all the winds getting across. There's a picture of it actually coming over Halifax, Canada. Now, what they had to do is change their schedule now. And it's very important because people in the United States, they all wanted to see what time is it going to fly over my city. Uh, <laughs> they let schools out to take a look at it. Uh, I mean, it was just quite, quite the thing. And you can see the new schedule here. Left on May 3rd, Frankfurt, Germany. And on May 6th, passed over Boston, then Rhode Island, then Connecticut, then New York, and then finally New Jersey. And those are approximate times, so we're going to go through this, uh, how it came across in the United States. And this is a great picture. Boston, Massachusetts, 11 a.m. on uh, May 6, 1937, this was taken. And uh, they said it was at the Boston Public Library when it came through. Then it came over the area where the Boston State House is, finally got it to Massachusetts. This was about 11 a.m. And the picture on the left is the actual picture of it. And the picture on the right, I like to do it, that's what the Boston State House looks like today. It's a lot of fun when you compare these, uh, these photos. Now it's flying over the, uh, I had to do some research to find out what building it was, is the Custom House Clock Tower. Still around 11 a.m. The times are a little bit uh, arbitrary because a lot of times they was, he would, the Hindenburg would circle around the cities a couple of times. But that's in the general area. Then it came down south, westerly Rhode Island. And this is kind of a really interesting photo. At 1 p.m. now, the public library and the photo on the left, if you look up where my arrow is, you can see the uh, kind of the shape of the uh, Hindenburg flying over. And that's a picture that I got of the library today. That must have been quite, quite a, uh, <laughs> quite the thing to witness this. Then they went north a little bit. Hartford, Connecticut, and this is around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's a great shot. It shows the uh, Traveler's Insurance building. It looks like it's a lot closer than it is, but it's so large, it makes it look closer. And there's the actual building on the, uh, on the right. So this is really a, quite a New England story. This is a rare photo. Waterbury, Connecticut, now it's heading south a little bit here from Hartford. And that's just, uh, I guess someone just took it just in one of the small towns in the streets in Waterbury. Then it came down to Danbury, Connecticut. Imagine that at around 2.30 p.m. And uh, someone took a picture from their backyard. You can see how low that, how low that is.
Now it's three o'clock in the afternoon and the, and the Hindenburg finally got over New York City. And uh, that's one of the better shots. Uh, nice, basically a nice clear day. You can see how low. Once again, they, it won't go any higher than uh, 600 feet or lower than 300 because the pressure is so different and that uh, would create some structural problems with the, uh, with the airship. And it's still three o'clock. I guess they did a, uh, quite a circle around uh, New York City. And you can see once again, I, I, I've got a picture on the, on the right what it looks like today, and there's a picture back in uh, 1937. And they also, this, it was, it was difficult to find this picture on the left, uh, I guess because the waterfront changed quite a bit. But you can see my red arrow, there's a Hindenburg, and you can see um, the docks, and the docks are still there apparently today, and I've added a few on that picture. Continuing, uh, the Empire State Building. And of course, most of the passengers actually were German citizens visiting their relatives in the United States. And that's what made, uh, they were really wanted to see New York City. Now, Jersey Shore, around 3.30 in the afternoon, we're getting close to uh, Lakehurst. There's a great shot of the, the beach on the right. That's how low they it came in there. And uh, a lot of these photos were just, uh, you know, general people took them and, uh, in the area. They saw it and they were excited and uh, they're going to keep those photos. And this is the uh, coastline of the Jersey Shore. And they're getting some warnings about an electrical storm approaching. This is quite a problem here. Um, of course, this picture looks pretty good, but uh, when the storms come up late in the afternoon, they're extremely dangerous. Now, this story is kind of interesting. There's my father in the picture on the left. He's in the center. Uh, of those three, and uh, before he was married, <laughs> and they all worked at the E. Ingram Company in Bristol, Connecticut, and after the, after the first shift was over, he told me that without telling anybody, it was one of those things, hey, we're going to drive from Bristol all the way to Lake Hurst, New Jersey, <laughs> and we're going to watch the Hindenburg land. So the shift was over. They got in the car, there's the car right there. I got a great picture there. Um, there they go, all the way down to New Jersey. And they arrived at five o'clock because generally that was the time everyone expected the uh, Hindenburg to land. And on, this was on May 6th, 1937. And he took that picture on the right. Now it, it's really good because you can see the um, the older cars in 1937. You can actually look and see the hangar. You can see the railroad tracks. You can see the Hindenburg circling. And it couldn't land. A uh, big electrical storm was coming. And the captain wanted to land. And the uh, Lakers said, no, you're going to have to wait and let this, thing, this storm pass. And that's another great shot he took. You can see. Uh, there's the hangar, and uh, about five o'clock in the afternoon on that day. And on the left, that's a booklet that I found that my father had, and it's a book 
printed by the United States Naval Air Station in Lakehurst, New Jersey, uh, summer of 1936. And I have that, uh, I have the actual booklet right here. I'll just hold this, this is, this is, a, <laughs> this is a great souvenir that I have. And of course, that shows the uh, Hindenburg and uh, shows it Hindenburg. You can see right there. Shows it on the back, and it's loaded with all kinds of uh, inside inside pictures and photos. It, it's it's a, it's an amazing book. Um, Cost twenty five cents. <laughs> so I'll we'll go to the next slide now. From 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., it was circling around uh, New Jersey shore, waiting for the storm to pass. Finally, it cleared for landing at 7 p.m. Now, my father and his buddies, uh, <laughs> they had to get back to Connecticut, and they waited for one or two hours, and they said, we've, we've had enough of this, so they took a few pictures and headed back to Connecticut. So I don't have any photographs that he took he was not witness to the actual crash. And this was the most photographed news media event of the day. First ever in history where live photos and live movies were taken as the Hindenburg was coming into Lakehurst. You can see all the movie cameras and whatever. It begins its descent. And everybody's all, all ready. Uh, must have been quite a, quite a sight back then. Because before that, no one had any pictures of any of the events in World War I or um, any of those events. It was always a day after. And if someone had a couple of photographs, that's all that was in the newspaper. In this case, they had move, moving cameras on it. And they were broadcasting it live. Now, hydrogen gas, it, it escapes one of the 16 cells, and the Hindenburg bursts into flames. There's an pi actual picture of it. And this happened at 7.25 p.m., May 6, 1937. That's amazing. It was, it was starting to come down. They, start, they started to drop the lines so they could uh, guide it down. And it's right in the back. So you can see where the, the cell was, uh, one of the 16, right in the back near the tail. And uh, so my witnesses said it wasn't really an explosion. It just, it just took off. It just uh, uh, burst into flames. And there's another couple shots. It uh, cracked in half, came down. Very close to the ground, it was like three, 250, maybe 300 feet when it caught fire and it slowly came right down to the ground. They said the fire lasted in 37 seconds and the whole outside covering was completely burnt off in, in about 37 se seconds. And this is a great picture because it shows Navy ground crew, of course, you can see all the white hats they have. They all rushed to the field because they were going to have to hold the ropes to, to pull it back down. And when it exploded like this or caught fire, they all went the other direction because they were afraid it was going to land right on top of them. And you can see on the lower right corner, there's a gentlemen there just escaping. You can see all the outside uh, frame, uh, skin is all burnt off. It went really fast. 35 passengers, it was low. A lot of them jumped to their death as it was going down. A lot of them, when it crashed on the ground, and they just jumped out the windows. And there's a picture, actual picture taken of one of the, uh, one of the survivors. And this is amazing. The whole thing just crumpled up. And you can see, the ru now the rush was on. All the Navy personnel all ran toward the Hindenburg to try to help save as many lives as they could. So now the Navy ground crew returns back to, to, to help everybody to get out.
And it's amazing because this crash scene, that's what it looks like. And 62 passengers and crew were actually rescued. They survived this uh, incredible crash. And I put this slide together. You can see un uh, I got the broken down by the passengers, the crew, and then the ground crew. Of the passengers on board when the Hindenburg caught fire, there were 36. And of them, 13 were fatal fatalities, and they rescued 23. Of the crew, of course, there's quite more, a lot more. There were 61. And they had 22 of them died and 39 were rescued. And one on the ground crew, apparently the uh, Hindenburg came right on top of him. He died. So actually there's a total of 98 folks on board or the Hindenburg with 36 fatalities and 62 were rescued. And the Captain Ernest Lehman there on the right, he died the next day from severe burns. And on the bottom, Captain Mott, another captain, he survived but was badly burned. Newspaper articles are over here, there's two here, the New York American. Hindenburg explodes at Lakers, 34 dead. The Providence Journal, of course, had a front page that ran the next day. And there it is, the frame, that was all that's left. You can see it just crushed. The heat was so intense. And there were actually 28 native German passengers that came over to the United States here. And this was taken in a hangar at, uh, in New Jersey there, Lakehurst. And those were all the castics and they were going to fly them back and go back on another flight to Germany. Now, potential causes. This has been debated pretty good. <laughs> Five potential causes. Sabotage. Someone probably, uh, they thought, had a bomb placed on it because of anti-Nazi uh, sentiment in the United States. Two, mechanical failures. Three, hydrogen explosions. Four, lightning. And five, uh, someone heard a gunshot. A gunshot went through it. And so many people in, in different technologies, NASA was involved many, many years ago. They had the films. They um, tried to figure out exactly what caused. So I just put down here the most likely scenario to date, keeping in mind you could have new technology in the future that could um, give us some more evidence. Number one, here's how, here's how they think it worked. The airship was charged with static electricity from the thunderstorm as it was going around uh, waiting for the storm to pass. Two, this is very important, the captain did a real sharp turn and they think because of the structure of the Hindenburg, if you do a, uh, a quick turn, they believe someone heard the snap that the one of the construction cables inside it snapped. And um, number three, the cable ripped into one of the hydrogen gas bags near the tail end of the Hindenburg. And number four, as the ground crew tethered the airship, they have ropes down, they have to pull it into position for, for docking. They essentially grounded the Hindenburg, which caused the stored static electricity to discharge and the spark ignited the hydrogen. Number five, they basically concluded there was no explosion. The fabric on the hull burned off in 34 seconds as the Hindenburg crashed to the ground. Number six, all seven million cubic feet of hydrogen gas burned up. But number seven, you had diesel oil from all the four engines and that was on fire for a long time for several hours after the crash. And number eight was interesting. The scrap metal frame collected 
was collected and shipped back to Germany for recycling. And what they did is recycle it into Luftwaffe fighter planes and bombers. Here's a picture of the probable cause. Inside frame construction on the right, you can see that when they're constructing it, see how those look, look like uh, spider web lines? Those are individual cables. And if they start snapping on you, putting stress on it, they could have uh, just snapped real quick. And there's a, one, of the, one of the 16 hydrogen gas bags and ripped a hole right in the gas bag and set all the hydrogen uh, inside the, uh, the, back, the back of the Hindenburg. Now, some of the artifacts, this is interesting. Look at some of these artifacts that were collected. A lot of silverware, a lot of... Uh, you can see the uh, silverware with the markings on it. A lot of these were in the, uh, uh, the remains after it, uh, after it caught fire. Here's a whole, uh, <laughs> a whole place setting with the dishes. And of course, I had the coins, Hindenburg coins, and of course, my souvenir booklet. What I have is, uh, which, uh, which is, I will always keep. Then the Lake Horse Naval Air Station today. The hangar is still there. You can see it, and the, the two doors are slightly open, and they have a memorial. Um, down here, and they put a chain around it. That's the exact spot where the Hindenburg crashed and caught fire. Now, the Zeppelin Museum, of course, the Hindenburg airship is called a uh, Zeppelin. And in Germany, they put together a uh, museum and I got some photos of this. It's amazing here. You, you see on the uh, right there, you got a German uh, Zeppelin flag. Down below, they, uh, inside the uh, museum, they constructed the <laughs> scale part of the uh, Hindenburg. You can see that. You can see where the windows are. Where the, you can see where a lot of the uh, passengers smashed the windows and just jumped right to the ground. Did a great job here. And there's another shot of it. Um, and on the lower left, they actually have the, uh, from the inside of the Hindenburg, all the uh, bracing to show you how it's constructed. And this is pretty, pretty neat. They have, when you walk there, you, it's like you're walking inside the Hindenburg and what they put you know, of course, you're inside the museum, but they put the pictures of what it would look like, uh, the elevations view from inside the Hindenburg. You can, you can imagine what, what a thrill that had to be to, uh, to uh, actually ride this. Of course, the tickets I mentioned before, episode uh, two, I believe, today's money, $26,000 a ticket. So it's really all for the, uh, the wealthy that were on there. And it's just just amazing here. Um, I've got two pictures here on the uh, on the left here. I've got the uh, picture of the Hindenburg leaving Frankfurt, Germany, May third, nineteen thirty-seven. And of course, it took an extra day to get there uh, because of all the headwinds across the Atlantic Ocean. But that's kind of a neat picture. There it shows a German couple, and he's. Gentleman's got his hat off. He's waving, probably to goodbye to family members. And then over here on the right, I've got the Hindenburg crashing in uh, Lake Hurst, New Jersey. And basically, <coughs> excuse me, the New England story. I just summarized for you here. Um, On May 3rd, of course, I left Frankfurt, Germany. On May 6th, I put the times down where it passed over Boston. 
Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, and started circling Lakehurst, New Jersey. And that basically is my uh, New England story uh, of the Hindenburg, part three. Couple books if you want to take a look at them. This one's, this one's terrific, it just came out a couple years ago. And this book here is excellent too. And if you, if you pick these up on uh, Amazon or something, believe me, you won't regret it. Excellent, excellent pictures of this uh, tragedy in our country. So once again, it's Dave Norton from Discovering New England History and have a good evening.